I have to say, I don't promise anything about giving a talk because <laughs> I realize I said to Ajahn Amaru that I came to an age and a time in my life and there was nothing to say really anymore. I am not as real, I'm not just kind of joking. <laughs> and uh, basically, um, from my point of view, I'm not saying from your point of view, you know, and uh, probably best to, <laughs> to stay quiet. But it was, um, I also know the mind well enough to not listen to it when it's not appropriate. And also, um, for those who are going to be teaching in the future, that as soon as you turn to a group of people interested in Dhamma, for some reason, you something is motivated in you, not just to give a talk, but maybe to help people who are hoping to get some help with the practice. And uh, even if <clears throat> it's been done, it's been said, it's been done many times, but like uh, one thing I noticed with Ajahn Sumedhu, when I was a, a, a beginning, beginning the training with him, he repeated himself um, quite a lot. He repeated himself. It's not that he, he didn't feel, to me, he didn't feel like repeating himself, but he was on a, on a similar topic for quite a long time. And uh, at some point I realized that if one does not know the mind very well, or just don't, doesn't have a kind of relationship with the mind, which is a bit more distance than the relationship we have when we identify totally with the mind, then we can't actually see why somebody maybe dwells on one particular topic for quite a long time. And what we know is that, uh, maybe I'd I like to let you know that, because many people Know, know this already, but also a number of people might not be aware of, of that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who told, who told me that they get really fed up when they hear the same thing. <laughs> it's not somebody from here, not a layman, not a lay, sorry, I, be, I betrayed myself. <laughs> not a laywoman, not, not a, a monastic, but a layman, <laughs> a friend of mine, my ex-husband, in fact. <laughs> He thought that people were things were just being repeated, repeated and repeated, you know. He didn't have much of a sense maybe of, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's just the way it was. But um, the, the, the mind that is, uh, the mind needs really to be known for what it is. And um, one thing that really helped the, helps it is to be able to, um, for the mind, which includes your ears, which includes all the, the senses, as well as the emotions, as, I mean, the, the feelings, sorry, the feelings, sensations, as well as uh, the um, a kind of a perception and the, you know, the, the thoughts, the thoughts or the activity of thinking. And uh, the last one being um, the, gosh, I forgot it now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the totality of it, I can't remember now, but anyway, it, it, the, the, if the mind is not really um, known for what it is, you still believe it. That's a trouble. We still believe that what it says, what it does, what it thinks, what it says, is real forever. You know, we don't think of it forever when it happens, but we act as if it was going to be forever. We believe in it as if it was going to be forever. We don't realize yet that everything is changing. But just to go back to what I was talking about, um, you know, our, the last one was a sense, you know, sense consciousness, by the way, uh, you know, after 
after thought construct it was anyway i'll go back to it at some point but <clears throat> The repetitive aspect of the teaching, which we find in the Buddha's teaching in the suttas and so on, has to do very much with hearing and hearing and hearing again and again and again. And it's needed because our conceit, our habits, you could say, of conceit, has a tendency to think it knows already. Right? Because thinking gives you the sense that you know. But the Buddha is not about but his teaching is not about thinking about the teaching, it's actually realizing the teaching. It's two different things. And this is one has to be careful, because the lack of humility sometimes in us comes from the fact that, oh, I know all that already, so what, you know, she said that, he said that, I know all that. That has nothing to do with the path. The path itself is a path of realization. And to realize something, you really have to be um, familiarize with that thing. And that's a word. I was listening to a, a very famous monk in France called Mathieu Ricard, who was talking, he's a Tibetan for the last 40 years, and used the word familiarize, which is a, a French verb, you know, to become familiar with something. And that's something we don't use this word so much in our tradition. Yet it is a word that is touches it touches something in me that's softer than maybe other thing we used in our tradition and this word of familiarizing is a gentle approach to what, something we don't know yet now the mind thing oh i know all that oh yes i've heard this i've read this i know this i've heard it i don't need to know that again and again but actually you know the the practice itself is not just to know intellectually, as you, we all know that. I think most people will intellectually say the same thing as I'm saying now. Of course, intellectually, it's not what we are looking for. We use the intellect to help us to get into the right direction. We use the intellect to be, be able to help us to familiarize itself to, so we, get, become, we become really knowledgeable about what the Buddha says but also knowledgeable about the realization of what the Buddha says. And that is something that our own conceit, our own fear, our own anxiety, our own desire to be um, special and so on, um, is in the way. It's not in the way, but it's, it's what keep going, keep kind of creating the sense, I know already. Yes, I've read that book, I know already. And yet, you know, we don't know. We don't know yet until we have realized it, until we have experienced it many, many times. It's not a question of experiencing it once, having a big bang and then experiencing it. It's a question of actually um, familiarizing, that's why I like this word, familiarizing ourselves with the Dhamma that the Buddha talks about, right? Just become more at ease with what we see, with what we experience in terms of Dhamma more at ease and relax with what we begin to know through our practice of meditation, through our practice, so, so our practice in general. Now, one thing that I, is very close to my heart, to myself, something that really um, close to my own personal experience and uh, that I like to talk about is, is, a, is a, how many times people for example, you know, maybe you, you know the Noble Eightfold Path with right view, right intention, right this, etc., etc., down to right uh, mindfulness, etc. You know, we can know the whole Eightfold Path quite well intellectually. Yeah, we can recite it, we can remember it. It's very useful to actually have that, you know, to be able to remember this path. But, you know, what we often forget right, is the fact that do we really practice, for example, right view? What does it mean to practice right view? Now, this is one of the great, you could say, great gifts of this tradition, because it's actually going straight to seeing clearly as it is, without any 
addition without anything added, complicated, extra, um, extra things, we actually look and see. Now, most of our realization in, for example, for right view, doesn't come necessarily because you understand, you know, you think you understand right view, you become, you become familiar with what? What do you think you become familiar with? You become familiar with wrong view, which we already know. You know how many times we think we have right view when we're actually not yet recognize what wrong view is about. Now, wrong view, none of this is a problem, by the way, for me, none of this is a problem. It's a question of knowing for what it is, as it is. Simple. No, it's not kind of regurgitating a whole book or regurgitating a whole experience you had, you know, 20 years ago or something like that. But it's actually, um, you know, getting to see very clearly, for example, what wrong view is. What did the Buddha say about right view? What did he say about wrong view? So one aspect of wrong view, of right view is the fact that everything is anicca dukkha anatta. You know, everything is impermanent, everything is unsatisfactory and everything. That's the Buddha's talking, not me. And everything is, um, you know, not, not, our, not us, not self, not me, not mine, right? Now this is right view. Okay, that's one aspect of right view, right? Now, what do we do with this teaching? Once we have this teaching, what do we do? Now, very often we get caught up in the idea that we should know this right view now, on day one. We should see this right view on day one. And then we get very miserable, we get really depressed and unhappy because we don't get it on, on day one, <laughs> even on day 300. So the, the right view is something that we really uh, understand by understanding the limitation of wrong view. Most of you, most of us will not be here if we hadn't got interested in this aspect of wrong view, which is really painful in a way, just by itself. The fact that we think everything may be permanent, that's really painful, that's like a prison. When we think everything is, you know, as, uh, okay, happy and should be happy, not unsatisfactory, like the Buddha points to, points to you know, it should be happy, I should love you, so you have to be happy. I, I, I should be really enjoying myself all the time. You know, when things are just slightly off balance, oops, we feel something is wrong. But actually, life is like that. It comes and it goes, happy and unhappy, keep going. So when you, when you are with the, um, when, you're, when we are, you are really practicing the Dhamma, you, what, what maybe you forget is practicing the Dhamma is not about getting it right. It's about recognizing what is not in tune with the teaching of the Buddha? What is not in tune? How many times do you, do you realize, I mean, do you, do you see clearly that you're acting in such a way that you think is going to be, you know, going on forever? And yet, how many books we've read on Anicca? Oh, we get very disappointed, miserable, di um, you know, um, dissatisfied or critical and uh, demanding of ourselves and others and so on. I mean, what I say, it's, about, it's, it's in and out, it's on both sides. The person who wants person and any connection we have with others, you know. So we think we're going to get it right. And then yet, unfortunately, we have not maybe familiarized ourselves enough to what this teaching is about. This teaching is not, not about getting it right straight away. The teaching is about little by little, as the Buddha talks about, like the, you know, the, 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 the sea, I think the water, I can't remember the beautiful image of the water and the kind of the, the water coming up, you know, kind of moving very gently up to the, the earth, you know. It's, it's a very gentle movement of, the, of, of oneself. It's not like being bang. Right? Little by little, slowly, patiently, kindly, we begin to see 
the changes in ourselves, little by little. Yeah? Why? Why is little by little? It's because to see something clearly, you can't have just a battle and a war with it, because you won't see it clearly. You will just see, you know, something that's constantly moving and agitated and suffering and unhappy and so on, you know. You won't be able to see it as it is. You don't need to add your reactivity onto what you see. The meditation is actually pointing to the fact that our reactivity is an obstacle on the way. The reactivity is adding misery upon misery. So the mind may be, uh, let's say, dissatisfied, and then you start being dissatisfied about the dissatisfied mind. So where does that lead us? Piling up more dukkha. <laughs> yeah. So we're not here to keep on shaking the misery of our mind. We're here to just relax and see, how can we see something clearly? Have you, have you noticed in your daily life for anything, not just Buddha's teaching, but for anything, to see really clearly, you have to slow down, you have to, um, you know, be interested in looking, you have to not wanting things to be different, to see something as it is, you actually, Huh? You actually do, you do this very patiently. And yet our, our system, I could say, I'm a human, this more human mind and body tend to be quite impatient. It wants to have things straight away and you want to have, you know, um, result straight away. And that in itself keeps sort of slowing down the process of letting go, letting go, little letting go, and then one day you drop something completely, liberated from that particular thing you were trying, you were learning how to let go. So I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about, but hopefully you do. <laughs> So I was almost prepared to say, I want three questions to give this talk, otherwise I won't be able to say anything. <laughs> so, even though I may come across a bit, a kind of hardcore, I'm not a hardcore at all myself, you know, I'm just kind of, this is the way I speak, this is the way I speak. I'm kind of enthusiastic, that's all. <laughs> I'm an enthusiastic type. So when you really want to sort of walk the path in a correct way, you have to notice what bars, bars you, stops you from doing getting, or getting might not be the right word because we're not getting anything according to the teaching, you know. But if you really want to understand something and see as things as they are and let go and free yourself of whatever you need to you feel you 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 want to be free you know it's a matter of as the buddha says again and again being very very patient and this is for me close to my heart because even when i was a lay woman myself i realized i was very impatient like many most people you know not so special I just kind of uh, wanting things to be done really quick, fast, and, you know, getting the result fast, quick, and being really frustrated when I didn't do that. And then um, I remember saying to myself, if by the end of this life when I die, I am actually more patient. I don't know, whether, don't ask me where it came from. It's a wisdom, I think it's a wisdom realm somewhere that's telling me, you know, if you are more patient, you will have done a big work. I didn't even know Buddhism at the time, you know, but I was aware that I was impatient. That what brought me this teaching. Do you understand? I was very much aware that I was um, not really uh, yet ready to bear with things that what are, are difficult on the path. Yeah. So, having said all this, you know, 
um, patience is mostly another aspect of loving kindness. You know, you don't have loving kindness without some patience, with a lot of patience. And you don't have patience without loving kindness. And so this is something that um, I want to say a few, a few things about, because again, like loving kindness, we, um, I mean, I'm talking from my own experience and the experience of people I've been with over the years, you know, there's a tendency to think that I should be patient, I should be loving, I should be caring, I should be kind. How many people tell me this over the time I've taught, you know? I should be. Are you? Why should you be? Have you asked yourself? Why should you be kind? Why should you be patient? Why should you be, you know, what, what are these do in terms of experience that we need to notice? Have we noticed when we're kind, what happens? Have we noticed when we are patient, what happens? It's not a matter of reading a book and remembering it you know, remembering the words. We can do that, unfortunately. But it's also noticing how we are, we are affected by these feelings. What happened when I'm patient? Is there something good comes out of it? Or is it, you know, is it a waste of time or have other things than just being patient? <laughs> I notice when I'm patient, I'll tell you what I noticed when I was patient, it's almost when a patience and mindfulness and kindness, they all come together in some ways. You have, to, you have to be kind to slow down, you know, because the mind doesn't slow down so easily, right? You need to be prepared, right? And then you have to be, um, you know, ready to also um, listen to what's happening, be in touch with what's happening, feel what's happening, know what's happening. So for me, when I... Even now, when I'm more patient, <laughs> I'm not so impatient. I'm morely, mostly patient quite often, most of the time. But when I'm impatient and I go to patience, I notice suddenly it's almost like moving in another, another world. Do you understand? It's a strange thing. Mindfulness is another world anyway to me. <laughs> it's a world of goodness, you know. But when you suddenly are more patient, I notice my, even my fingers are more in the right directions. My mind is more clear. My, um, it's something happened. It's, it's kind of not so defined. I noticed that for many years, you know, it's not yesterday or something like that, but I noticed that. This, this act of patience, this act of mindfulness and this act of kindness all together brings something better, I would say, that what we can do when we don't have those qualities together, you know. So in a way, they, they, they tend to be, um, you know, to, to help you, to, to help us, you could say, to um, lead to a better result for anything we do. They, they bring a better result. Instead of throwing the, 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 the milk in the, in, the, in, the, in the tin or whatever on the floor, you stop suddenly. You don't do that. You you know what to do. Instead of you know forgetting many things, suddenly this mindfulness, kindness, and patience you know reminds you to what you need to do in the present moment. But this is not something that is expected you to be born like this. Otherwise, you won't bother with Buddhist teaching. It's actually a teaching which is something we learn day by day by day by day through experience, day by day by day by day through the result, seeing the result day by day. So you really know deeply that what you see, what you experience is, is, is true. You know, it's not like you believe blindly the Buddhist teaching, but through the experience you have on a daily basis and on a daily um, recognition that the mind is very imperfect. You know, it's not perfect or imperfect at the limit, it's more caught up in its own stories, in its own history, in its own desire, its own wanting, its own delusion, and so on and so on, you know. So this is a mind. And then we complain about our mind, don't we? 
My mind is not like this, it should be like this, it should be like that, it should be this, 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 that. And by the time you've said you, how, how, many, how many things the mind should be, you get a man, magnificent headache, you know? You get a migraine because there's so much things that it should be, but it can't do it on its own. That's why you're on the Buddhist path. <laughs> so it can't do it alone. It needs help. Many people complain about the, 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 the part of ourselves that the Buddha calls Atta, Anatta and Atta, you know, the self. That me, the personality, the part, the part of us that believe that external things are going to change us. I mean, they can inspire us, they can help us, but it's not what's going to transform us, you know. And then the aspect of self is also the, the aspect that thinks that self is, you know, is me forever. Self is me. I am self. I am what this I. And I will only be this I, because that's all that I am. But again, that's a delusion. That's exactly what the Buddha's teaching is about, to discover the delusion of this perception of thinking that you are I. Because you think if you, I disappear, you, you disappear with I. <laughs> when I disappear, the only thing that disappears is delusion, by the way, just to give you confidence that you'll be okay. <laughs> you only, the only thing that goes is, you know, avidya. And avidya means simply not knowing the Dhamma, you know. So that's all that disappears. You know, your knowledge of Dhamma becomes an open road when you stop believing that you are I, me, mine. But again, it's not something that comes, you know, suddenly. I mean, it can come suddenly for some people, I don't know. But it's a, a slow looking at things which you think is me, Atta. The more you bring your attention and your mindfulness on the part of you that is not Anatta or that is still self, the more you help the mind to be disillusioned with this self. You become disillusioned with the fact that this self, you begin to see its nature. Its nature is really, unfortunately, not really uh, in harmony with the reality of now or the, the truth, I would say. Yeah? So this is what happens when you get to know yourself better. You know, when you get to see the fact that the limitation of me, mine, is real. It's not a joke. <laughs> it's real. But people say to me, gosh, you know, my ego, my ego, my ego, you know, I wonder what I do with my ego. I mean, I've repeated, repeated this many times by now. What do you mean, your ego? Your ego is not a problem. Your ego is all you have to see your delusion. That's a really the best place to look at delusion. It's me. And it's not a judgment. You don't judge the ego, the atta, the atta. You don't judge that because that would be really piling misery on top of an ego that's already suffering from not having enough wisdom or that's still, you know, completely entrenched in the deluded view of things. So don't add more. I say often, you know, remember this ego is here to help you to see clearly that, you know, avidya is really creating a lot of misery for you. So thank you, ego. I say thank you, ego. Bow to you, ego. Go to your shrine if you have a shrine. Say thank you, myself, for helping me to see as I am when I'm deluded. Because instead of fighting with your ego, you start actually bringing metta for something that is not capable of freeing itself and seeing clearly the way things are. Yeah? When you stop battling with me, then you give it a break for that me to be seen as it is. 
you can see things as they are. Me, it's just, I mean, it's made of greed, hatred, and delusion. I mean, poor me. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? That's personality view. It's, it's kind of, is entrenched in greed, hatred, and delusion. What do you expect from me? It doesn't get it wrong all the time. I'm not saying this. It's helpful in many ways as well. But on another hand, you have to have a lot of compassion for this me because it's trying very hard now. It brings you all the way to Amaravati. It brings you all the way to the Dhamma. It brings you all the way to, from America, all the way to Amaravati to, you know, to, from many, many places to study the Dhamma. Why? Because you are dissatisfied, unhappy, not free, etc., etc. It's a long list, isn't it? So this ego, start making it a friend rather than an enemy. I know in, I have to be careful what I say with a lot of Asian people who study in, in Asia because, and the Buddha, I don't know if, the, I've never seen the Buddha talking about Kilesa as enemy, but many people in some circle of the world will talk about the <coughs> Kilesa's enemy. But Kilesa is not an enemy. Kilesa is simply, you know, a deluded state of mind or a miserable state of mind. So instead of seeing it as, you know, as, as, as an enemy, just help your mind to understand what Kilesa is about. And that takes a good lifetime, I can tell you, from my own experience. <laughs> it doesn't go straight away. So don't expect it to leave you tomorrow, you know. Anger, greed, delusion, whatever, jealousy, envy, blah, blah, blah. There's so long the list of kilesa. But it's something that you just, you know, kilesa again um, will help you to be more patient because you, you know already that you may know those kilesa. I mean, I know my kilesa quite well, but it doesn't mean that they suddenly disappear because I know them, you know. They will come again and I have to be vigilant. I have to be mindful, I have to be really alert to the fact that Kilesa don't just disappear like phantoms in the dark, you know. They disappear once you have seen them often enough to really clearly, clearly understand that the Kilesa are a source of pain, a source of suffering, a source of blindness, a source of all the things that you find difficult, you know. So by the time you see this over a period of years sometimes, then you're ready to drop them. You're ready to let them go, or at least little by little. You're ready to give yourself a chance to not live with them too often. So the meta aspect is very important for everything. <laughs> if you, even if you practice just meta every day, that would cover quite a, a big field of your life. Do you understand? It would not just meta, it would also cover many other things. Right? Because meta is not a question of just being. Um, Softy and letting yourself or other people do what they want. It's not that. Metta is not that. Compassion, metta. Metta is more the, the capacity to approach something with a gentle heart. And it's really hard. You notice that. Most of us have quite a hard heart. We brought up in a in a in a in a you know in a part of the world where you are often asked to get very strong and tough and you know and push and try it hard and harder and harder you know it's a it's a society it's a culture which really uh, doesn't is not is not kind to the heart it really makes you hot, you know, 
um, kind of tough. But it's not a toughness that has wisdom in it. It's a toughness that a pushing beyond your can, your capability. How many people have seen in my teaching periods, you know, young people, smart people, very, very good. They had everything to, to go for themselves. You know, studying at the best school, being invited to have grant at the best university in the world. You know, and they can't, they don't want it. They can't take it because they came from a culture which was different, like Thailand, where there's more and more of a soft, soft touch, you know. You can see it. When she, <laughs> have to be careful, she comes from Thailand. She's, she's very soft touch. <laughs> Doesn't mean your personality is not tough, but the touch with the world, you're much more careful. I notice in Thailand. <laughs> Because you don't have that kind of pushy Western kind of style, lifestyle, you know. We've all been through them. Most of us Westerners have been through this, you know. And it's, it's, um, it's not easy to let go of it. Because you feel if you let go, you're just going to be a, a sponge, like, you know, and that just kind of can't hold anything, can't do anything. So learning how to do things with a soft heart, a soft approach. It doesn't mean, as I said before, uh, a day, uh, you know, a kind of careless approach. It's, it's a truly a, an intelligence in us as an aspect of a deep intelligence of the mind, you know. And it, it's hard to learn. It's not easy. Not easy. But it's learnable. <laughs> One can learn it. I, I can speak from my own experience quite easily because I was uh, very tough on myself. Very hard, you know. Pushing, pushing. So I know that very well. And I really encourage all those who recognize as being pushy and tough. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's, it's different from what the Buddha talks about effort or chanda, you know, interest. It's different, isn't it? Tough is just blindly pushing, pushing to get first, if you can. You know, that's a kind of toughness, isn't it? To be better than others or to be better than what you think you should be. You know, so that requires from us the whole practice of, of, the, of the teaching of the Buddha requires a kind of finesse, a kind of, a, a kind, not subtle, but a refinement of perception, a refinement of your thinking mind, a refinement, and refinement is it's not like you change anything. The refinement comes absolutely naturally when the quality of mindfulness Loving kindness and patience come together. This is a refinement of a Buddhist, a mind following the Buddhist path. Not saying we should, but that you, you can experiment, you know, with that. I know for me it has worked. It works. So remember that when you <laughs> hello when you um, want to really free yourself from something, it will, as you know, you probably have read this ma many times. Uh, do not, you know, don't, don't, don't. If you do it through aversion, aversion will will win. And what happens when you do it something from aversion? It doesn't work because it bends back like a like an elastic band. You understand? If you do something like aversion, I don't like it. It go ping, go straight back into your face. You know, it'll come back again and again and again. That's why patience is about is not to do. And yet, for a long, long time, 
we don't have any other knowledge. Don't remember, we, we're not supposed to be arriving at Amarawati enlightened, and we're not supposed, I mean, some people maybe are, I haven't met them yet, but, you know, you're not supposed to arrive here knowing everything, you know, savvy with everything, being able to know all the Buddha's teaching and so on, you know. You come here to learn little by little. Slowly, you make mistakes, oh. And say, oh, damn it, you know, gosh, I've done the same stupid thing, you know, I've done that yesterday and the day before, and you're what an idiot. So, in the Buddhist practice, you stop acting like this, and you say, well, thank you for showing me that I'm not yet enlightened, quote unquote, <laughs> but I'll do something better next time. I mean, I used to do this as a young nun, I'll do it better next time. I had to have these things, otherwise <laughs> I would have killed myself, I think, if I'd followed my own, you know, kind of, what do you call that, my own uh, desire to get it right. Yeah? So every time you do it better, you, you tell yourself, I'll, I'll try my best, better next time. Yes? And the next time, you're happy because you're more mindful, you're more, you know, remember what you said to you. The mind and body, they have this beautiful memory of the good things as well as the bad things, you know, good things. And so you suddenly can remember, oh yes, last time I did that, yeah. It comes back. And then you are a bit more careful. But you manage still to say a word that you don't like, <laughs> or being impatient with somebody who's not fast enough, you know. And then you say, oh, I did that last time. So okay, okay, I, 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 I won't say anything. Maybe this time I won't say anything. Yeah. So it's a it's a really gradual, gradual training. Don't beat yourself up. Don't hate yourself for not getting it right. Don't criticize, judge yourself. And that means because if you do this for you, you do this for everybody else. That's a trouble. It doesn't stay at yourself. It goes on through the whole room in here. You'll find somebody that can continue the desire to criticize himself. Somebody, sorry. Yeah? The mind is clever. It'll always find an object that corresponds to what it wants, you know? It's not going to leave you alone. So that's why the, the, there is a certain amount of urgency of following this path because the habits of our mind are very deep, you know? The habit of criticizing ourselves, others, judging, etc., is very deep. And it's useless, you know, it's like criticizing. It doesn't really help anybody, judgmental. Is, but metta does help. Metta, acceptance, metta. You see somebody is doing something stupid. <laughs> if you're like me, I'm still doing these things sometimes. I go and tell them that, what they should do. But instead, I, 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 I have to say, I have more admiration, I, I more respect for people who are a bit more cautious, you know, rather than... Because you, do, you, you go and help people, you think you go and help people by trying to make them do the right thing. <laughs> but actually, I notice the people who don't see it so quickly have better results. I'm not a subtle type, you know, I can, I can go and tell people what to do better, which sometimes works because it's needed, you know, but... So when you go back to this, you know, the fetters of Atta, right? Believing in that is permanent. Second, believing that rites and ritual are going to do the job. When he's done the job for some of I, some of it myself, just to at some at some point that is, I I used to say, they say, oh, do you pray? I say, you know, in my life as a nun, I've prayed all the time for things to come good, but I have no idea why I pray. It's more like a, like an intuition. It's more like a, you could say um, an intention, you know, rather than a, anything else, an intention. Talking about intention, I'd just like to remind you, if you remember what those three intentions are on the Noble Eightfold Path, it's all about metta. 
right? It's not Buddha that hasn't forgotten it. Intention to abandon, let go, renounce, first. Second, the intention to be kind and loving. And the third intention is about not being violent and harmful to others. So those intentions are primary on the path. You know, they are very important. And they can help you to really train the mind to stop hating people, to stop criticizing people, you know, to stop judging, you know, trying to make people feel bad or trying to make others pull them, put them down and so on, you know. It's hard. The training is not easy. It's easy said, easy remembered. But when it comes to acting on what is needed at the right moment, we can easily be blind. You know, easily be blind. Not that we want to be blind, we are blinded by our delusion. You know, you said, you said to yourself, okay, next time I will be ready, I won't be angry, I won't be this, I won't be that, you know. And then suddenly you've lost your mindfulness and you go back straight to the same scenario. Not that you, you're wrong, it's just a bit more work to do, that's all. You know, this path is about working. Working on transforming mind, body. It's not about getting it right, you know, forever to show off other people or any of yourself. But it's simply just to, you know, discover this path of transformation, of path of liberation, path of little by little. So, well, it's feast time is the same, I, so there is nothing to say, and I should know by now because, in a way, a lot of the teaching we are give, we give from the beginning, from eighty, eighty three, and eighty four, something like that, it's always given following the Ajahnsha tradition. So just letting the heart speak, you know, and you haven't got a clue because most of the heart, <laughs> I don't have much going on, you know, it's quite peaceful. And so you think, oh my God, there's nothing to say. But it's nice, you know, hopefully that I share a few things of my own life experience. I can maybe <clears throat> give you something to think about or to experiment yourself practice with and to see how much you can be <laughs> how much you agree or disagree with the people you know ticket uh, talking and so on it's not a question of agreeing or disagreeing anymore you know it's like you listen if it's helpful okay if it's not helpful that's fine too you know so you don't have to agree with anything with anything that this person speaking on this chair you know saying so I wish you well and a good continuation of the retreat. <laughs>